good morning and welcome to the Navigator's Bible class. Uh, like I said, we are currently studying the um, chronology of the life of Jesus. Last week, we passed out charts of the Passion Week. We have these charts, there's five of them. I've put a skeleton of the first one up here for you. Uh, the Passover week, if you have that one, uh, please please take that out. If you don't, we'll make some more copies this week. Uh, I also will probably put those uh, PDFs or JPEGs of those on the uh, email so that it, you can print your own if you want to. But anyway, there they are. Um, the Passover week chart is, a, is probably the main one, and the reason is it's got a lot of places to write. I put a lot of notes on mine, and um, uh, so uh, that can be sort of a worksheet for you, the Passover week. Last week we mentioned that the Jewish day starts at sundown. We could say 6 p.m., but that's an approximate time, sundown. And it goes from sundown to sundown the, the, uh, the end of the next day. So uh, in Jewish uh, time, we would be in, uh, on Sunday, our, our first day of the week would end at 6 p.m. tonight. Uh, so just to kind of get you to understand that, these little lines here on the chart represent 6 p.m. So from like this Friday starts at 6 p.m., and goes to 6 p.m. here. This is all Friday. We understand how that works. Okay, that is important because the Bible is has that in there uh, related to times. That's how it is uh, organized. That's how it is defined. Also, we mentioned the first month in the Jewish calendar given by God to Moses is, uh, was found in Exodus 12. The first month. Now, God gave that to Moses during the time that the plagues were being handed out to Egypt and Pharaoh and those guys. And so God goes to Moses and says, this is going to be how you will organize your calendar. Uh, this will be the first month, and they call it uh, Abib, or after the um, after the uh, captivity, Nisan. Uh, if you hear those two um, those two words, they refer to the first month, and their first month spanned the last part of March into the first part of April. That was their first month. And so God says, all right, we're going to start now, and from now on you can begin your calendar this way. Uh, one of the reasons for that, when uh, they came into Egypt. Remember Joseph's brothers sold him out and all that. And Joseph was down in Egypt and then they had a the famine and all that. So when uh, Jacob and his family came into Egypt and they uh, lived in Goshen, they came into Egypt as a family. They left Egypt as a nation. There is a difference. So some people would say the nation of Israel began when God says, this is your first month. 
Uh, some people say that they didn't really become a nation until they crossed the Red Sea and went out of Egypt's territory. That may be. But I believe that when God did give this particular calendar thing and says this is the first month, I think that was sort of their July the 4th. You know what I mean? Where the nation looks as where it began. Um, okay. And um, we talked about uh, the Thursday through Sunday over here. Let me come over here and point these out to you. Last week we talked about Nisan 8 through 11 or Thursday through Sunday. And in John 12, it says that Jesus and the disciples travel to Bethany six days before Passover. So if you back up six days, you come to Thursday, or nice and eight, okay? They traveled there, and then uh, they had dinner, supper, at Mary, um, Martha, and Lazarus' house, here, okay. and then we mentioned that the next day after that was this Saturday, and it says the next day when he went into Jerusalem, which would be in here, that's where they did the palm things with blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So. Palm Sunday that we celebrate over here actually came on Saturday, uh, nice and <clears throat> 10, okay? And on the 11th, uh, he began to be questioned by the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and all the guys that really had something against him. Uh, but we, that's what we talked about last week. We also mentioned Jesus being anointed. And there's something we need to clear up here because some people can look at this anointing of Jesus and say, wow, there's contradictions in Scripture. And one thing we want to do is realize that there are no contradictions in Scripture. If it seems like something is, you know, uh, a paradox or something in there, then we need to study and figure out what it is because there are no contradictions in Scripture. The contradiction came about in John 12 that we just mentioned. They were they traveled to the house of, of uh, M. M. and L. <laughs> Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And uh, they had their dinner here and Mary anointed Jesus with this uh, real expensive perfume. You'll see that in John 12. They were at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house, and Judas objected to it. He made a point to object to this. Why, we could have taken this, and why, we could have done that. And Jesus knew, well, the reason he wanted to do that is because because he holds the money. Um, but that event happened here in the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, if you go to Matthew 26 and Mark 14, you see Jesus being anointed again. Or if it is another account, if it is another another account of what happened with Mary, then you've got a problem. Because in Matthew, uh, it says in verse 2, two days before the Passover, that this anointing happened. Well, two days before the Passover would be Monday. 
not Friday. So in Matthew and in Mark, we see Jesus being anointed on Monday. But if we read these passages, you'll see these differences. Number one, obviously this is two days before the Passover, not Friday, but Monday. And this happened after the triumphal entry, which happened on Saturday. So on Monday, nice on the 12th, is when this anointing happened. And Mr. Schofield incorrectly identifies it as Mary. Incorrectly identifies it. Because in Matthew and Mark, this takes place in the house of Simon the leper, not in Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. A different location. Also, you'll see uh, that some of the disciples objected when this happened to themselves. They're, they're thinking, oh, why, is, why, is this, why is this going on? They didn't speak it out loud, but Jesus realized they were thinking that. And also, the woman that did this is, uh, I didn't put it up here, but I should have, the woman that anoints Jesus at this time is not named. No name is given. So if you say this is Mary, then you've got conflicts here. You've got a conflict as to where it happened, a conflict of when it happened, and a conflict of who objected. Whereas at Mary's house, Judas objected. See? And vocally so. I think what happened was that when this second anointing took place that the disciples remembered what happened on Friday and they're thinking the same thing. There are many similarities between the two, but there's differences. Also, these two anointings that took place were anointings number two and three. There was one that took place before for this back in Luke chapter 7 and this happened right after the Sermon on the Mount a couple of years before this and so this then would become the first account of Jesus being anointed this also by an unnamed woman and then the second one would be the one that Mary anoints on Friday, and then the third anointing would be uh, this one here, also by an unnamed woman. So three times we have Jesus being anointed. If uh, that is the only conclusion that when you compare Scripture with Scripture that you can come to, okay? otherwise people say, well, there's, you know, scripture messed up over here. Yes. And when Mary is uh, at Lazarus' house, Mary the, is said to anoint him with his feet. She does it on his feet and she wipes his feet. The one in Matthew, she pours it on his head. Okay. And also this one here, I believe uh, she, the, she used her hair. Uh so there were differences in these anointings, three different ones, three different times. So I wanted to point that out to you because there are those who would jump on this and say, well, there's an error in Scripture here. No, you need to study. You need to pull the facts together. And uh, that's why I wanted to just hit this particular event uh, a little more in detail than than we normally would. Okay, we move to Sunday, nice and 11, which is the day after the triumphal entry. When we come to this, we see a, a number of items on our list. We have our list here, our chronology list, 
Um, starting at number 163 and going through number 181, there are all these different items that happen uh, on on Monday. Now, so, or Sunday, some of these may have also may have happened on Monday. Uh, so it's it's totally impossible to say if they happened on Sunday or Monday. Pro likely some of them happened on Sunday and some of them happened on Monday as you go through this list in your study. I wanted to point that out to you in case you were reading through these scriptures. And you really should go through every one of these and see what happened. We don't have time to do that in our class, but in your study, that's what you should do. Um, go to John 12, if you would. John 12. This, um, this likely happened on, uh, on Sunday. And uh, on John, thir and John 37, uh, John 12, 37 through 43, uh, let's look at those verses. It says, uh, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Uh, all these miracles, all these signs, all these wonders, and yet they, the, the people, or you know, the leaders mainly, uh, believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord be revealed. Therefore, watch it carefully. Very interesting. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and that I should heal them. That's pretty strong for the sovereignty of God. He hardened their heart for a reason. And we know now the reason was that they would crucify him that they would not accept him as king, but that they would crucify him. Um, going on to this, uh, verse 41. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Nevertheless, and this is, this is very interesting, verse 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also, many believed on him. There were many that did believe on of the chief rulers, most of which hated Jesus, but some of them did believe on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They would not admit that they believed on Jesus, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Yes? Concerning this scenario here, wouldn't you say that just the fact that they, the very next verse, that they were, some did believe, and then some didn't. Right. And they, there is a choice. Yes. Between, I mean, so God, I mean, my, my commentary says this, that they were already had a hardened heart. God just gave them over to their hardened heart. Or do you think that God said, okay, this, these ha Pharisees here will have a hard heart. These ones will, you know, total. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Does How everybody do you, understand the uh, question? Yeah, did God separate the good and bad versus we choosing good or bad? That's the question. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you this. What is the condition of the unsaved man? Will he ever seek God? The answer is no. No. 
What must happen to the unsaved man for him to believe or to come to God? God must start a work in his heart. If God does not start a work in his heart, he lets them go on. Their hearts are hardened. He lets them go on. And just... So it's all initiated by God. It Salvation is always yeah. initiated by God. We must understand that. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. He sought us. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none, no, not one. Yes. Isn't it also our part to lighten their hearts, make it open to the gospel? No. No. Our so part is to down what? On that one. <laughs> what is our part? Our part is to spread the word. Yeah, let him get we cannot you. do anything to the heart of man. We only spread the word. And the Holy Spirit takes the word and does with it what he wants. You see, that takes the responsibility off of us. We cannot convict anyone. We cannot, by our intellect, convince someone to be saved doesn't work that way. It's a spiritual thing that must take place in the heart and God is the one that must do that. Didn't mean to come down on you hard there. But it isn't also for us to pray to that individual that their eyes would be opened. Yeah. Yes, we can pray, we can testify, we can spread the word, but it's God that will do the work. Yes, John. In order for somebody to be saved, the first got to realize that they were lost. That is true. But that is one of the things that God does. Yeah. He shows them who they are and what they need. That is God working in them because they think they're cool. They think everything's fine. Okay, uh, so Jesus explains this in these verses that we just had. Israel as a group, Israel nation, see, as a group believed not. They were blinded and hardened. However, as some individuals did believe, but did not confess him. You know what one of those people's names were? He wasn't a he wasn't a chief ruler, but he was a fisherman. Who was it? Peter. What happened when the rubber hit the road? He denied he knew Christ. Remember? He denied knowing Christ three times. And yet look what God did with him. <clears throat> so someone would point to these individuals who would not confess Christ because, what, what did it say? They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Maybe they feared the men. Maybe they, that's it, they, they feared the men so they did not confess well, they would be basically in the same boat that Peter was. Now, Peter was a believer. And he was so broken up about this. And he cried with bitter tears because he did not confess Christ. What about the Pharisee? I can't think of his name right now. That went and seen Jesus Nicodemus. in life. Nicodemus. He was actually a believer, right? He Yes, he but was. He Matter of fact, Nicodemus was one of the ones that helped uh, with the body of Christ yeah. after after his death. But when he went to see him, he hid. He went at night. He didn't want right. anybody to know. That that's exactly it. So this is this is given to us as an example. It doesn't mean that we don't have to 
you know, we can get away with not confessing Christ before men. We should. We should always be ready to give an answer. But did these men believe on Jesus? Yes, they did. And what did Paul say when asked, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So according to Paul, these men were saved even though they didn't have the guts to stand up for him. And just like Peter, I think that they were ashamed. And maybe later, they came back and, and, and stood up for him. But this is given just for our example to look at and see. All right, on Monday, nice and 12, we see, and by the way, Matthew 26 and Mark 14 set the day as Monday. Um, Mark 14, for example, says, uh, After two days was the feast of the Passover of unleavened bread. So when he's giving you what's happening, this is two days before Passover. So we back it up and it's Monday. So these things are happening on Monday. That's what sets the day. Okay, now, uh, Jesus here was anointed by that unnamed woman that we mentioned at the house of Simon the leper. I don't know who Simon the leper was, but obviously he had been healed by Jesus and was hosting this dinner for Jesus and his disciples. That happened on Monday. Now, some of the events of that number 63 through 181 in this list likely happened on Monday. Some of them happened on Sunday. Some of them happened on Monday. We're not quite sure. But all those events happened in this part of the week. We come to Tuesday. Nice and 13. Bad number, right? <laughs> um, nice and 13. And here's what we have. We have Judas selling out Christ. This is when he goes. Uh, if you look at Matthew 26, I'm going to flip back over to Matthew 26, verse 14. Uh, then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest, and said unto them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they coveted with, coven, covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time, he, Judas, sought the opportunity to betray him, Jesus. So this is the day that the deal between Judas and the chief priests were made. 30 pieces of silver. Now, this is prophesied clearly in Zechariah. You don't have to turn to it. I'll read it for you. Zechariah 11, verses 12 and 13 says this. And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was praised at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast it to the potter in the house of the Lord. Now, there's a lot of things in that verse. We know about the potter's field, right? We'll get into that in a minute. But this is the exact amount that Jesus was betrayed uh, for. Psalm 41 also prophesies about Christ's 
betrayer. And I'll read that to you. Psalm 41 verse 9. It says this. Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. That's what the psalmist said in prophecy of Judas. Now, we do know that this psalm, this verse, is specifically about Judas because in John 13, verse 18, Jesus confirms that he was talking about Judas. In John, what did I say? 13, in John 13, verse 18, Jesus says this, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Jesus quoted that verse to his disciples about Judas. So we see Jesus definitely telling us that is about Judas. That's whom the psalmist was mentioning. Now, Judas Iscariot is, shall I say, a controversial figure. Uh, a lot of people think a lot of things about Judas and who he was. Uh, we do know that at the very least, Satan entered him for him to do these things because it says so uh, in, in, uh, in John uh, that Satan entered into him and he went out uh, from the, uh, the Last Supper. Jesus, in John 6, verse 70, called him the devil. In John 6, 70, Jesus said, Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? That word is diabolos, and that is only spoken of as Satan. Satan. So he literally called him Satan, the devil. We do know, as he's referring to him, that this word, the devil, could, could mean that he was possessed of the devil at the very least, or he was the devil at the, at the other extreme of looking at it, but Jesus did call him that. Um, let's look at some more and see see some more about it. In John 17 verse 12 Jesus referred to Judas as the son of perdition. Verse 12 says uh, while I was with them in the world I kept them in thy name. He's praying to the Father. Those that thou gavest me I have kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus is referring to Judas by a special name called the son of perdition. Paul referred to someone by that same name, Paul identified the Antichrist as the son of perdition in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. He says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there be a falling away first, He's, he's talking about the rapture here. You know, uh, that day when, when I... 
and it says, uh, or, or the second coming, excuse me, and it says, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Paul is identifying the son of perdition as the Antichrist. So we've got Judas being identified as the son of perdition. We've got the Antichrist being identified as the son of perdition. Jesus calls him a devil, or at, at, at best, he is of the devil, you see. But there's more. Turn, if you would, to Revelation 17. Revelation 17 talks about the Antichrist. The beast he's referred to in several places. Leading up to this, we've got the son of perdition uh, as a name that Jesus gave Judas. We've got the son of perdition as a name that Paul gave to the future Antichrist. And in Revelation 17, you have a description of the beast. And then down in verse 8, look at verse 8. It said, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. You've got an individual here that was on the earth at one time. You've got an in individual that at the time of John's writing was not on the earth. Where was he if he was not on the earth? It tells you he was in the bottomless pit. And it says, he will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition or destruction. So, he was here on earth. He is not here on earth. But he will come back to earth. And if, uh, I don't have this in my notes, but back at uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2, um, verse 9 it says even him whose coming is after the working of Satan he has a, a second coming who is the antichrist somebody that wants to fool everybody into thinking he is Christ and he has a return his coming is after the working of Satan and John identifies him in Revelation 17, verse 8. Luke, Luke identifies him in Acts 1, 25. This is uh, pretty definitive. Acts 1, 25. You remember after Judas hung himself, they were left with 11 apostles. And they had to come up with a 12. Or so they thought. Um, so they picked Matthias. Uh, then Luke goes ahead and to record uh, what happened to uh, Judas. Um, verse 25, speaking of Matthias, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by transgression, fell that he might go to his own place. Judas had a place that was referred to as his own place. It didn't say he would just die and be buried. It didn't say he, he would, his body would, would die and his soul would go to hell like that rich man in Luke chapter 16. It said he went to his... This is, this is said of no other person in Scripture that when he died, he went to his own place. Now, I must point out to you that um, 
Jesus in Matthew 24, was it? I don't want to give you the wrong thing. I better look it up. Matthew 24, or... Yeah, Matthew 25, excuse me. Uh, verse 41. Then shall he say to them on the left, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. It was made before Adam sinned. Okay? Hell was not meant. For man, hell was meant as a place to confine the devil and his angels. So when Judas went to his own place, he went to a place, see, that was made for the devil and his angels. So you could say various things about who he was. He was a man who was possessed by the devil to do the <laughs> things he did. Or he was, when he was here, he was the same individual that will be in the tribulation period. Uh, I'm, I'm not real sure, but there is convincing evidence that Judas, while he was a man, will be again on the earth after we're gone. Um, lots of things the Bible is not totally clear on, but all these things point to that, yes. I guess I I don't, yeah, I, I think that all makes sense. I guess why scoot around the fact that he's the devil? I mean, why not just say Well, Jesus did say devil. that. Yeah, he did. One of you is the devil. But why Why wouldn't like Luke and that, just say, or you know what, I, like other places to verify Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's, we'll never know, but I guess. Why, why did scripture reveal it in that method, yeah. in that way? Don't know. Right. That's going to be on my list someday. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a list of questions <laughs> that I will be bringing up. <laughs> One of them is why were there mosquitoes? <laughs> uh, don't know their purpose. <laughs> But uh, there's, there's a lot of questions I would like to ask. That would be a good one. Uh, why were you not more clear in Scripture regarding the person of Judas? And I think the response was, would it, will be, um, what more did I need to say? We'll understand it better by and by. Yes. Next week, we're going to get into... The illegal trial of Jesus. We will get into the Last Supper. We will get into the words of Jesus to his disciples after Judas left. Remember, Judas went out to betray him. Then Jesus began to focus on the 11 that he had there. And when you get to you got Matthew, Mark, and Luke that are telling you all these details. But then you have John that doesn't give you a lot of details, but he focuses in on the message that Jesus was telling his disciples. The comfort that he was giving them. The wisdom, the love that he was showing them in John 13, 14, 15. 16, 17, I love that. and he gets into that. So uh, that's that's. Remember, John was called the disciple that Jesus loved. Yeah. Not that he didn't love the rest of them, but John was special. 
Okay, let's uh, let's pray and then we'll uh, we'll head out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would give us a desire, a passion to study it. Help us to study, to be approved of you, working that need not be ashamed. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. In Jesus' name, amen.